Hi, welcome back to episode two of the Book Wanderers Club. I am Anna and I'm the author of the Pages and Co series, which is this one, Tilly and the Book Wanderers, Tilly and the Lost Fairy Tales, and the most recent one, book three, Tilly and the Map of Stories, which is coming out in paperback in a couple of months. Now, um, hopefully if you watched the first episode, you enjoyed it and got a bit of a flavour of what we're doing this time round. In episode two, I have three more brilliant authors for you to give you some reading and writing inspiration. First up, we have a book chat with Kelly Yang, all the way from California. Kelly is the author of Front Desk and three keys these are both out now and there is a third one coming so uh, I had a chat to Kelly about writing these books and how they were inspired by her real life so here we go book chat with Kelly Yang so welcome to the book wanderers club Kelly thank you so much for joining me all the way from you're in California right right I'm in Los Angeles so we are at very opposite ends of the day while we're filming this, but thank you for, it's early at your end, so thank you for getting up and <laughs> coming and chatting to me about Front Desk. Thanks for having me, I'm so excited. Um, so to kick off, could you give us a bit of an introduction to Front Desk and then we'll maybe have a bit of a taste of the story with a reading afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. So Front Desk is the story of 10 year old Mia Tain, who is a new immigrant from China. And she and her parents, go and immigrate to the United States where they don't really know anyone and it's very different from what they expected. They thought it was going to be like super nice and easy like in the movies and everyone has like a big house and you could live and do whatever you want, eat hamburgers all the time. Um, but it turns out it's really hard and she and her mom and dad, um, they get fired from their first job and they don't have a lot of money. And so they have to sleep in their car and things get really scary for her. And so they have to take a job working in a motel. And a motel um, here in the US is kind of like a hotel, except it's much smaller and it's um, a little bit more rundown. And because Mia's parents have to clean the rooms all day, there's no one to manage the front desk. So Mia, even though she's only 10 years old, decides to do it. And she's stepping into the role of a motel manager at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's really exciting for her, but it's also really challenging. Um, and there's lots of little things that happen. And she meets the weeklies, which are the people who stay at the motel and they pay by the week because they're more like permanent residents. Um, and she really likes them a lot. And she meets friends at school and things like that. So it's a story of how this one little girl has decided that she's going to take this situation and make it really work for her um, and try to find her voice and try to you know make a difference in her community at the same time. Amazing and also to people what I can't recommend it highly enough I absolutely loved it it's such a wonderful story. Um, so yeah why didn't if you're happy to do a bit of reading and give people a bit of a kind of taste of the story and Mia's voice. Yeah okay I'm gonna read from the first book um, so by the way, Front Desk is actually a series. So there's Front Desk and then there's the sequel, Three Keys. Both are available at the same time in the UK, which is very exciting. Um, but I'm gonna read from Front Desk, chapter one. My parents told me that America would be this amazing place where we could live in a house with a dog, do whatever we want and eat hamburgers till we were red in the face. So far, the only part of that we've achieved is the hamburger part, but I was still holding out hope. And the hamburgers here are pretty good. The most incredible burger I've ever had was at the Houston Space Center last summer. We weren't planning on eating there. Everybody knows museum food is like 50,000 times more expensive than outside food. But one whiff of the sizzling bacon as we passed by the cafe and my knees wobbled. My parents must have heard the howls of my stomach because the next thing I knew, my mother was rummaging through her purse for coins. We only had enough money for one burger, so we had to share. But man, what a burger. It was like a mile high with real bacon and mayonnaise and pickles. My mom likes to tease that I devoured the whole thing in one gulp, leaving the two of them only a couple of crumbs. I like to think I gave them more than that. The other thing that was great about the Space Center was the free air conditioning. We were living in our car that summer, which sounds like a lot of fun, but actually wasn't because our car's air conditioner was busted. 
So after the burger, my dad parked himself in front of the vent and stayed there the entire rest of the time. It was like he was trying to turn his fingers into popsicles. My mom and I bounced from exhibit to exhibit instead. I could barely keep up with her. She was an engineer back in China, so she loves math and rockets. She oohed and awed over this module and that module. I wish my cousin Shen could have been there. He loves rockets too. When we got to the photo booth, my mom's face lit up. The booth took a picture of you and it made it look like you were a real astronaut in space. I went first. I put my face where the cardboard cutout was and smiled when the guy said cheese. When it was my mom's turn to take her photo, I thought it'd be funny to jump into her shot. The result was a picture of her in an astronaut suit hovering over Earth and me standing right next to her in my flip flops doing bunny ears with my fingers. My mom's face crumbled when she saw her picture. She pleaded with the guy to please let her take another one, but he said, no can do, only one person, one picture per person. For a second, I thought she was gonna cry. We still have the picture. Every time I look at it, I wish I could go back in time. If I could do it all over again, I would not photobomb my mom's picture. And I'd give her more of my burger, not the whole thing, but definitely some more bites. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so the book is kind of partly inspired by your experiences as, as a child. And there's, you write a bit about this in the back of the book, but could you give us, a, sort of tell us a little bit about how your life inspired Mia's story? Yeah, so when I was growing up in the US, um, this really happened to me. I was, I think like eight or nine when my parents um, had to take a job managing a motel and they didn't, you know, of course, none of us knew what we were doing at all, which was kind of funny, but <laughs> they had to clean the rooms and the, there were so many rooms, it took them so long to clean that I had to manage the front desk as a child. And it was really terrifying at first, you know, you're like, oh my God, because nobody wants to take you seriously as a kid. Everybody's like, where's your mom? And I'll be like, I am my mom, you know? <laughs> so, um, but it was, so it was really hard as a kid to get people to actually hand me money and give me their ID and, so, and stuff. And uh, it was a really interesting life experience. And it was also something that I kept a secret from my friends which was the other thing that um, if I could do it all over again, I, I don't think I definitely think that I shouldn't have kept it a secret because now, as we all know, the story of Mia Tain is very relatable and so interesting and fascinating to so many kids around the world that I don't know why I kept it a secret for so long, you know? I kept it a secret because I never saw myself like represented in books or in TV or in movies. Everybody else seemed to have this like really nice life where they're living in like a palace and everything was always clean and they had nice clothes all the time. And that was definitely not my life. Instead, I was dealing with customers and I was trying to make sure, you know, that um, the pool was clean and I mean, all these crazy things. So I think the fact that I never saw myself represented, um, you know, had a huge impact on my childhood and made it feel like this was a secret I ought to keep. It was a shameful thing. And when I got older and I had kids of my own, that's when I decided that I needed to write the story of what happened to me. Um, so I can tell my own kids how I grew up. And the most amazing thing that's happened from this series is just a number of kids who've come up to me and said, because of front desk, you know, I'm able to tell my friends at school what my parents do. And because of front desk, you know, I saw myself in a book, um, that's been the most rewarding thing. That's amazing. I, well, I, I, cause I was gonna ask you what the kind of, what the moment was that you decided that you wanted to turn kind of your story into a novel. And it's so, it's interesting that it was to do with when you had your own kids and wanting to share that with them. Yeah, cause I realized like if I, my, my son was eight at the time when I started writing the story. Um, and I realized that he had a very different life than mine you know he lived in a normal apartment and had like toys and stuff and definitely had jeans so <laughs> I was really different from the way I grew up and I realized that it's strange if your child has no idea right mm -hmm. like this is now a secret that now we're carrying on for generations that doesn't seem right um so I decided that summer that I was going to tell him the story 
Um, but it was such an interesting and complicated story. You know, I didn't want to just tell him about the hard parts. I wanted to tell him about the joy and the wonder. It was just so much like magic happening at that time. It was really the funnest part of my childhood, you know, was bouncing around from room to room and seeing what everybody was up to. You just, you would never get bored as a child. Um, so I wanted to share all of that with him. And so that summer when he was eight, um, I, I wrote the story one chapter at a time and he would read the chapter with me at the end of the night. And it was like our thing for the whole summer. Um, and by the end of the summer, that was it. I had a book. <laughs> And how do, we've obviously heard, because of the reader, we've kind of got a taste of Mia's voice. How did you kind of find Mia's voice as distinct from kind of your voice as a real person, as a child who's experienced it? It's so funny. As a, I mean, I, it's so funny you asked that because I think as a middle grade author, we just, we never, we never progressed past 10 or something, you know? Like, <laughs> I think I am in some ways, I still have that voice in my head, you know, of that mischievous 10 year old. Um, and just like my own kids um, being around them all the time. I mean, I think I start aging backwards and become <laughs> sillier and sillier. Uh, but no, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really interesting. I think, I think it's hard for um, a lot of people. I think that one of my editors um, for front desk and she's like this amazing, you know, fabulous editor said that the thing that distinguishes um, really great middle grade and YA authors is that for some reason they're able to tap into that voice so quickly and it usually has to do with um, so she her theory was it had to do with something that happened to them that um, was so memorable that you could almost like snap your fingers and you're back in that mindset in a second and you know maybe for me it was like managing a motel at a young age you know, um, but I don't know. I don't know how you, I don't know how, it, how, I don't know how to explain it. Um, I also write YA, so it's hard to bounce back and forth. Right. From middle to YA. That's fascinating because I, so I, my book's a middle grade and I'm going to be pondering that once we finish talking about if there's something, what was my moment that takes me back to that voice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it was, you said, I was like, wow, I never thought of it that way, but I, maybe. <laughs> interesting to think about, isn't it? Um, okay, well, you've mentioned motels a little bit the difference, but motels are quite a kind of foreign concept here in the UK. Um, and so, because I think, I don't know, I, I, I was trying to like Google to like understand the differences between them for because obviously most of the people watching this are going to be British kids. So um, like I was wondering if you were able to just like go into a little bit more kind of detail about what makes a motel kind of a motel. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that the key distinction is you can drive up to your room. Um, so they usually have a big parking lot and it's not like a hotel where it's all in one building and you drive, you know, you might like pull up to the building and then you walk inside and then you go to your room on different floors or something. A motel is more like, it's almost like all kind of outdoors and the rooms are spread out and um, there's a huge parking lot and you usually can park right in front of your room. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also little things like I, I think there's no restaurant usually, um, you know, there's certainly no room service. There's, I mean, I don't know, there's a lot of little, little difference. They probably don't have the fancy shampoos. In there. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably most of our references, it's like, um, you know, if you're watching a TV or a film show and you see those ones where people there they're like two layers I think that traditional yeah, yeah, films yeah. and the, the kind of yeah. door to the apartment is just yeah. I remember finding them very confusing as a child when I saw them in films and tvs and uh but I went to America I stayed in a motel for the first time uh like two years ago and it felt very I felt like it felt like I was in a TV American tv show so we just don't have equivalent we just don't really have equivalent things here yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like an, it's like an inn um so it, it's similar to an uh I don't know if you guys have inns not not in the same like no not really <laughs> no oh, wow okay so where do people stay when they go and take a vacation take well, a holiday I think well we have a lot like the kind of um we obviously have hotels and then I think maybe we have like these this chain called travel in travel lodge okay. which yeah. it's more organized like a traditional hotel and that there'll be like a, a lobby and 
I probably still like somewhere you can go and have breakfast, but it's much more kind of, um, yeah, you kind of go and that's where we would stay. Like if we were getting the ferry to France, we'd go and stay in like a travel yeah. lodge, not like a hotel. Yeah, that's, that's probably like a motel, like a travel lodge. Yeah. 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 So more like, it's like, yeah, yeah. Travel lodge, but kind of it's, I think a travel lodge is somewhere in between, between a motel and a hotel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's so many different, then they're like the bed and breakfast. There's just so many different variations. <laughs> we love a self-catering cottage in the UK, I would say, like where you go and like do your self-catering and you just organize everything yourself and you just hire like somewhere to stay for like. Yeah, like an uh, Airbnb. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, totally. So the motel in front desk, the Cala, Cala Vista, is that Cala Vista? Cala Cala Vista. Vista. <laughs> um is the motel that they um run and I'm interested what were the things that kind of were the same as the motels that your family worked in and what were the kind of key things that you changed for the for Mia's story yeah so the so the key thing is that there was a front desk it's not like a window situation it's some place you can go into like an actual office um and I remember that you as a kid having to buzz people in so that part was real there was a bulletproof glass because sometimes these places were in like neighborhoods that were high crime. I mean, it was just a fact, you know, they're not always in really posh neighborhoods. Um, so as a kid, I was always really nervous with the whole buzzing people in situation because I didn't want to buzz in someone who's going to hurt me or, you know, take the money or whatever. And I was only like a 10 year old guarding all this cash, you know, so I was constantly freaked out about that. Um, that part was very, very real. You know, some of the parts that were, um, you know, obviously some of the, you know, like the most, I wanted the motel to have certain colors to have this really warm and inviting feeling. Um, so, you know, we also in real life managed three different motels. Um, so some of the little characteristics were just taken and combined with different um, places that we had worked at or stayed at or, or whatever over the years. Um, but yeah, a lot of those details are real. And um, for kind of young writers watching this, what advice would you give to them if they are kind of would like to think about writing a story based on their own experiences? Yeah, I would say um, that one of the best pieces of advice I've ever had was just to be honest. You know, um, when I was starting out writing, I wanted to write about all the places I'd never been. And I was always writing about like Europe or uh, France or what, you know, I don't know, just places I'd never been. I had no idea what I was writing, <laughs> what I was talking about. I was writing about big houses and dogs that I didn't have. Um, and they weren't really authentic, you know, and they weren't really special. You know, they were just, my imaginary life of what I could have been doing if I didn't have my life. And really what uh, was so special was my actual life. Um, so I just needed to find the courage to write that. And once I did, it was like the whole world just opened up. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I'll say is you, if you are starting out, you know, it's totally okay to write short stories. I was a columnist became, uh, before I became a novelist. And I think that training was instrumental Mm -hmm. um, just writing shorter pieces. And if you read my work, it's usually a combination of many, 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 many short chapters. <laughs> you know, even my YA stuff, it's like really short chapters for a reason, um, because I don't have a really long attention span. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> it's because like I was trained to write short things mm -hmm. and that's fine. And it's great uh, because then you get that like amazing feeling of accomplishment much faster <laughs> so <laughs> you don't that's have to wait for an entire 300 page novel that's great advice <laughs> <laughs> and you also have uh the, the kelly yang project which is a project for young readers and writers um could you tell me a bit about that and why you kind of wanted to set that up yeah so after law school um i didn't really want to be a lawyer I had realized this too late, um, but I decided it was not too late to change course and do something else. And what I really wanted to do, my big passion was number one, writing, but number two, teaching kids how to write, you know, mm -hmm. to really help them find their voice. And so I went to Hong Kong um, where I lived for like 15 years. And that's what I did. I taught kids writing, debating, um, public speaking, um, various different types of, um, you know, model UN, lots of different things. And it became this program that just kind of took off. 
a lot of kids loved it. And then there are other teachers who wanted to be a part of it. Um, so it became bigger and bigger. And I think, of course, now with the pandemic, um, it's been a challenge. A lot of us have to move online, um, but we still have, you know, we still have offices and courses available in Hong Kong for kids who want to who want to just do something after school and pursue that passion. Mm -hmm. And Mia wants to be a writer as well, although her mom uh, is like nervous that because she's not a native English speaker, she might find it harder and it's something Mia really kind of grapples with. And I, I'd love to kind of um, hear about kind of why you wanted to kind of explore that and what you wanted to say about kind of expectations and independence and finding your own path. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that was, I mean, to this day is always a struggle. My parents to this day are like, are you going to make it as a writer? <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> how many books are we now on? <laughs> um, but it's, it's hard, you know, because Asian American parents, and I wanted to portray this authentically, and I wanted to portray it without sugarcoating it, uh, but I also wanted to portray the love. There's an incredible amount of love that goes into um, some of the criticism that they <laughs> give to their children because they always come from a position of, we want the best for you. Mm -hmm. you know, we love you. We don't want you to have this hard life like we did. You know, So that starts from a position of love, but it can quickly become overpowering and just an incredible um, burden to have to live with as the child. So I wanted to, to put that on the page in a way that's never really been done before. You know, people always talking about tiger moms and talking about, you know, Asian American parents, like they um, are just like dictators or something. But in reality, um, it comes from a position of love. It also comes from a position of vulnerability and fear. Like they have had a really tough time, mm -hmm. you know, as immigrants and they just are worried about their kids. It also comes from, you know, the kid wanting so badly to prove like, look, I can do this, you know, have faith in me. Like I am enough. You don't have to help me. Mm -hmm. um, and that was definitely a very personal struggle of mine. Um, and many, many creators that I know um, have had that struggle mm -hmm. as well. It's, it's hard. It's hard when you're carrying like all your family's hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of us who are like, you know, first generation immigrants or only children, whatever. It's just like, oh my God, it's an incredible load to carry. Mm -hmm. and, and of course their, their experience as immigrants to America is a huge part of this, this story. And they face a lot of prejudice um, uh, from in various ways from people around them. Why was it you, and you've talked a bit about kind of the representation of seeing your experience in a book where I'd love to hear a bit more about why that was so important um, to have for you in your book. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's no way to talk about the immigrant experience or the people of color experience um, in America without addressing the racism, the discrimination, the passive aggressive remarks and microaggressions. You know, there's an endless list of things you deal with on a day to day basis. And every time it always sets you back a little bit. And that's what I wanted to show is like, these are experiences that we need to spend time to get over and heal but all that time it adds up and it 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 really sets us back you know like i've now wasted you know maybe an hour dealing with this guy who just said this to me now i have to waste you know two hours trying to get myself back in the right state of mind to mm -hmm. work on my schoolwork because that just happened to me you know so i wanted to show all of that because that was a part of my life it's a part of so many people's experience experiences. Um, certainly, um, certainly managing a motel as an uh, immigrant, it was, it was really, really rough. And it was hard. Um, but there were also these healing moments that were just like so powerful, you know, moments where people came together. And it was, you know, I think one of the weeklies taught my mom how to drive and, it, and just all these little moments where we really show like the humanity um, that, you know, we have so much in common and you know, we can be united and, and it's, it's incredible. It's a really powerful feeling. And I mean, that's, I think that's, you know, the book is so special because it really, you know, it really explores all these issues and these knotty things, but it's also ultimately an incredibly uplifting um, and joyful book. And I don't want to give away, I don't want to give anything away because I'm aware it's only just come out here in the UK, but it really, it's such a, it's such a wonderful book. Um, 
so as you mentioned that obviously Three Keys has come out at the same time in the UK and then you've got a third book coming out later this year. Um, so for people who are kind of just discovering your books here in the UK and again, don't want to get too spoiled, but could you kind of give us any clues as to kind of what people might, what where Mia's journey kind of goes after Front Desk? So she's definitely going to keep writing. Um, she's going to become really good friends with Lupe and Jason. Um, these are her friends from school and her relationship with Jason is very complicated, and especially <laughs> in book one. That's a bit rocky. That's okay. And part of the story is about empathy, you know, and we have to find it in ourselves to have empathy, um, even for people we maybe not necessarily agree with right in the beginning. Um, and so that's part of Mia's journey is finding that empathy for Jason. Um, and they're just going to keep having like a really, really magical and hilarious and, you know, heartwarming time, I think, at the motel. Awesome. Um, now, I hope that everyone who's watching has been as inspired as I have listening to Kali talk about writing and being inspired by your own experiences. Um, so to finish off, uh, Kelly is going to suggest a bit of a writing prompt so you can go and do some of your own writing um, inspired by this chat. So Kelly. Okay, so, you know, in Front Desk and Three Keys, right, is a story about a girl who goes from one part of the world to another part of the world and something really unexpected happens to her there. And so since we've just had this long period where we weren't really able to travel um, and hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel after everything goes back to normal, my prompt to you guys is where do you want to go after the pandemic? And I want you to describe your journey to that place and I want you to put something unexpected that happens to you there. Awesome. And I want you to take us on that journey. Amazing. That is a great idea. And as always, if you do do any writing inspired by the prompts from the Book Wanderers Club, there is an email address down below bookwanderersclub at gmail.com. And I would love to see anything that you write inspired by Kelly's prompt. Um, right. Thank you so much, Kelly, uh, for joining us from California. Um, and congratulations so on Front Desk and Three Keys coming out. Yay! Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye, guys. <laughs> Next up is where do you get your ideas from? Now this episode we have PG Bell telling us a bit about his inspiration. Now he writes the Train to Impossible Places series. So this is the first book, Train to Impossible Places. The second book, The Great Brain Robbery. And the third book, which has just come out, Delivery to the Lost City. So PG is going to tell us about three things that inspired his most recent book. Hi there. I'm PG Bell. I'm the author of the Train to Impossible Places trilogy, including the third and final book in the series, Delivery to the Lost City, which is out now. And uh, Anna has very kindly uh, allowed me some space on her YouTube channel. And she's asked me three questions about where I get my ideas from and some of the inspiration for uh, Deliver Delivery to the Lost City and the series as a whole. Uh, so the first question is, where did I get the idea for the Train to Impossible Places series? And that's quite a straightforward answer, actually. Um, it started as a bedtime story for my son about five years ago. Um, he asked me for a brand new story one night uh, that nobody had ever heard before. So I had to throw together loads of ingredients um, to come up with a story that I thought he would be interested in and that I'd be interested in telling. Now. I don't know about you, but I grew up with stories like The Magic Faraway Tree by Enid Blyton and Asterix and Tintin um, and adventure stories like The Lost World by Arthur Conan Doyle. I really, really loved those kind of stories. Um, and my son did too. Anything that can take you to a brand new world and let you explore. So I knew it was going to be that kind of story. Um, and my son was crazy about trains and I grew up around uh, trains and steam railways because uh, my dad is a bit of a, a steam railway buff um, and so I thought a, tra a train would be a fun way to get from one world to another and it all came out of there really um, and the idea of a postal train gave me the perfect excuse for the train to be visiting all these different worlds and for Susie our main character and Wilmot the troll postmaster to be handling all of these weird and wonderful magical items uh, the second question is, where did I get the idea for The Lost City in Delivery to the Lost City? Uh, right, I've got to tell you a little bit about the book um, at this point. 
Um, in delivery to the Lost City, Susie and Wilmot and the rest of the crew of the Impossible Postal Express have to return an overdue library, an overdue library book, which sounds really simple, except that the book is alive and it's eating information. It's literally sucking up all of the information from the impossible places and digesting it. It's wiping every other book clean. Um, and it's going to keep doing this unless Susie and Wilmot can return it to the place it came from. The trouble is, the library that it came from uh, and the city in which the library is found uh, disappeared hundreds of thousands of years ago and nobody knows where to find it. So they have to track down this lost city called Hydroborea um, and return the book before it will give back all the information that it's stolen. And Hydroborea is based on, well, all sorts of lost city myths um, from our own world, really. Um, it's an underwater city, so obviously there are traces of Atlantis in there. But uh, the main one is Hyperborea, which uh, first crops up in ancient Greek myth, and it was supposed to be uh, a magical, mythical island way up north um, in the frozen polar regions. And it was home to giants, but they were also scholars and they were, had supposedly forged this perfect society where everybody was wealthy and everybody was happy and everybody was intelligent and learned and it was the, the height of civilization. Um, so I thought it'd be quite fun to send Susie and Wilmot to a place like that um, but of course they find out that it's not quite so perfect as it's cracked up to be. And the third and final bit of inspiration for Delivery to the Lost City and uh, the Train to Impossible Places series as a whole, is libraries. Libraries are really central to these books. Um, as I've mentioned, in Delivery to the Lost City, my characters are trying to return a book from one library to another. Um, a, a library sits at the centre of the Impossible Places, and one of my characters, Frederick, is a librarian. Um, and that's the reason libraries crop up so much in my books is, I think, because uh, libraries cropped up so much in my own life. Um, I loved going to the library when I was a kid. I was very lucky that we had uh, a small public library literally at the bottom um, of my road and I would go down there at least once a week and there was a very, very famous, uh, very, very friendly librarian called Miss Joyce who knew me by name, knew me by sight and whenever I went in she would have recommendations for me, she would encourage me in my reading, she would ask me what I thought of the books that I'd taken out and it really made a huge difference. Um, I started devouring books as a kid um, and again I'm very lucky now to live fairly close to a library which at the moment due to the Covid lockdowns sadly is shut but uh, I will be getting back to it as soon as I can safely. Um, yeah and libraries are a really essential service and we've been losing too many of them and I think it's just really important to help to emphasise you know just the, the richness um, and the opportunities um, and the escapes that you can find in a library. So that's why they keep turning up in, in my books. Uh, so it just remains for me to say uh, thank you very much indeed to Anna James for having me on her channel. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit of the story behind Delivery to the Lost City. Thank you very much. Our last author for this week's episode is Josh Lacey, who is the author of the Hope Jones series. And Josh is doing our big questions segment. So if you watched last week, you'll know that this is when you get the chance to put some questions to your favourite authors. Now, this class is the same class as last episode, Year 5 from St Bernadette's. But um, as I say in the interview with Josh, I am looking for classes to take part. So get your teacher to email me at thebookwanderersclub at gmail.com. And that's also where you can just say hi if you would like to and also where you can send any of the writing that you do that's inspired by the writing prompts that the authors are setting in the book chat segment. So without further ado, here is Josh answering your big questions. So welcome to the Book Wanderers Club, Josh. Thank you so much for coming and being part of the big questions segment. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we, before we get into year five's big questions for you, um, we'd love to chat a little bit about your uh, most recent book. So could you tell us a little bit about Hope Jones and her most recent adventure? Sure. So um, I wanted to write something about climate change and I tried doing this for a while and uh, I did actually write a couple of different things and it just didn't work at all, um, mainly because the 
voice in it was my voice. And when I write about climate change, I just feel terribly depressed about it and worried about what's going to happen. And, you know, the world is collapsing and it's all going to, yeah, you, you can see where it was going. And so what I ended up writing was sort of utterly miserable and who would want to read that? And then I came up with the character of Hope and she transformed the story and took it over. And as you'd guess from her name, she's much more optimistic than me. And she's a much more sort of energetic and forward looking person. She's a 10 year old girl who wants to do her own small bit to solve climate change. Mm -hmm. And um, in the first book in the series, she gives up plastic. And in the second book, this one here, she stops eating meat. So that's what, um, and the book is about how she deals with her school and her family, her little brother and her big sister and the neighbors and her general environment. But that's it, very simply. It's one ordinary girl making her contribution to stopping climate change. Awesome. And are you hoping to explore kind of more environmental issues with Pope and keep going with the series? Yep, the third book, which is gonna come out in the summer is about air pollution and the sort of twin things of what air pollution does to the the climate and so the effect that air pollution has on climate change that's the first thing and second what air pollution does to our bodies and so the sort of story is sparked by one of hope's friends having an asthma attack and hope discovering about you know that what all these lorries and cars and what the diesel and the petrol fumes do to the environment. And then she ends up trying to persuade everyone to walk to school or cycle to school rather than coming by car. And yeah. So it's kind of tackling these big topics, but with a, a hopeful kind of approach. That's the idea. Awesome. Now, uh, from I'm tempted to say from the sublime to the ridiculous, although some of these questions are, well, it's a real mix. Um, we've got some questions from year five at St. Bernadette's. So it's the same school um, as the last episode, although just yeah. tangent to say I am looking for classes to get to join in with Book Wonders Club for future episodes. Uh, and if you are watching and you would like your class to join in, you can email me at the Book Wonders Club or get your teacher to email me at the Book Wonders Club at gmail.com. So back to St. Bernadette's and Josh. So we have, I've got 11 questions for you actually. I've snuck in an extra one. Um, so this is what year five at St. Bernadette's would really like to know from an author. So um, the first question is from Evie and she would like to know, where is your favorite spot to sit and read? Oh, that's a good question, Evie. And the answer is, I, I read everywhere. It's embarrassing, but I don't really, you know, I mean, I, I suppose my favourite spot would be in bed, but uh, that's where I like reading best, but I would sort of read everywhere and um, uh, while eating breakfast, on the sofa, on the floor, but you know, if I was going to, if I was going to read a book right now, I think I'd go to bed. Yeah, yeah. this is a good shout, this is a good shout. Um, kind of linked to that, Logan would like to know if you have a special place that you write. Um, I, yes, I have a room where I go and write and I shut, it's in my house. So I try and shut the door and say to the rest of my family, leave me alone. Doesn't work at all. No one takes any notice, but yes, I do. But I mean, when I'm thinking about a book um, or trying to get ideas, then my special place is outside. I go for a walk and wander around and, you know, but when I'm actually sitting down doing the hard work, then it's, a chair, a desk, that's it. And that's in my house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amy, this is a great question, a very specific question. Amy would like to know if you had to spend the rest of your life on an abandoned ship and there was only one thing you could take with you, what would it be? Um, Amy, that is a good question. And I'm assuming I'll be able to sort of, you know, catch the odd fish or, you know, get some fruit or so I think uh, my answer would be I would like the ship to be bringing coffee from Brazil and it would be full of coffee beans so for however long I was there I would be able to drink coffee because that's coffee is the one thing that is really important to me so if you could have a an enormous ocean you know ocean liner full of coffee beans I'd be happy. Okay, that's a great answer. <laughs> um, 
Amelia, this is I'm so this is such a good question. Amelia says, if you got to pick your pen name, what would it be? Oh, that is a good question, Amelia. I actually I did get to pick my pen name because I wrote um some books under a different name, but I, I picked the wrong name. So <laughs> I wish, Amelia, you had asked that question then. And I think if I had to pick a pen name, a, might I have to say William Shakespeare? No, that's not a good idea, is it? Although I'm curious, Amelia, if you are watching this, do email me at the email address and tell, tell us what your pen name would be if you've got yeah. one in mind. And I'm sorry that I couldn't think of a good name <laughs> in my head. That's it's a bit of a that's a hard one to uh, off the top of your head think of something uh have to report back if you come up with a genius one um serena asks uh what do you think the most interesting thing about your writing is oh serena that is a brutal <laughs> question um i can't answer a question like that what's the most <laughs> interesting thing that, that's like the sort of question you get in a job interview, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. My problem is I'm a perfectionist or, you know. Yeah. That, um, Serena, I, re I really don't know. Um, <laughs> I think you've I answered it yourself already when you were talking about hope and talking about the little things that you we can all do to change the world. I think that's a pretty interesting thing about your own. I suppose I can, I can answer it for a particular book or something yeah. like that. But, uh, yeah. Um, okay, here we go. Here's another one. I think this is this this one we might have a we might have a better chance of success on. Charlie asks, although I don't know, it's a big question still. Charlie asks, if you could be a character in any book, uh, which one would you choose and why? Um, and I'm guessing you're not thinking one of my books, Charlie. You're thinking any book at all. I well, I think it includes your books, but also includes all books. Um which is again, there's a big pool <laughs> to choose from, but I, I think I'd like to be Tintin. Um, I've always loved the Tintin books. Mm -hmm. I loved them when I was a kid, and I still love them. And they're sort of, you know, they're my comfort reading now. If I'm feeling ill or feeling a bit down, I'll read a Tintin book. And Tintin has such amazing adventures and can go everywhere. And and the idea of sort of, you know, setting off with Snowy and Captain Haddock and with the Thompson twins somewhere behind, probably in a Jeep, trying chasing to keep up. Um, is, can I be Tintin? Does yeah, that that's answer a great the question? Shout. I'm okay. glad you mentioned Snowy as well, because that would be a key appeal for me of being yeah. Tintin. That's, that's my answer then. Um, Ashin would like to know, who is your favorite celebrity? My favorite celebrity of all time? Yeah, and you, I think you can interpret celebrity however you would like it to be as well. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, I'm afraid it's someone who's dead, um, but it, my, my favourite celebrity would have to be David Bowie. Oh, great. Um, yeah. So, uh, because he was not only so brilliant, but he was so interesting mm -hmm. and he did so many different things. Mm -hmm. He was a singer, a writer, an actor. He was so creative. He transformed himself and and he was one of those sort of people, a bit like Tintin. I loved him when I was younger and I still love him now. So, um, that, but does he count as a celebrity? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. he's an icon, yeah. Uh, Georgie uh, asks, if you had to save one of your books from a fire, which would it be? And again, I think this perhaps means your, or the books you own, you're not necessarily you, of your books that you've written. Oh. Although you can, I don't know, it's not specified, so you can interpret it however you like. Um, I mean, am I allowed to have a book full of photos? Does that count? Yeah, I reckon, I reckon that's... I'm afraid, t uh, you know, sentimental though it is. I suppose if it's a fire, I'm allowed to be sentimental, aren't yeah, I? Yeah. I, <laughs> I would take a book of photos of my kids. Mm -hmm. So that would be, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, right, Saoirse has a, a philosophical question for you. Um, do you consider your books as your family members? You know what, there's a sort of saying that having a book is like having a baby. And uh, I have to say, that's not really true for me, no. So um, 
I don't consider my books like my family members know. I have uh, two daughters and they are very different. Um, <laughs> I feel very differently towards them, how I feel towards my books. Yes. That's fair, that's fair. Uh, Kiva asks, if you had infinite money, which books would you buy? And again, you can't just say all of them. <laughs> As, um, that is such a good question. Um, I would, there are so many books I'd love to buy if I had infinite money. I'd definitely buy a sort of, um, I mean, I don't have that much interest in the sort of books as fetishized objects, you know, that sort of thing of first editions. And, but I think that's probably because I don't have infinite money. But if I had infinite money, I probably would. I would go <laughs> and buy a first edition of Vanity Fair mm -hmm and um, some of Shakespeare's plays and um, Animal Farm and my god I'm already imagining an entire library full of the books that I would um, yeah. That um, so the last question is from Herman who asks what is your secret of making a really good book? Um, I don't think I've discovered my secret yet I'm still waiting to find it. If anyone could tell me I would love to know but what is the secret? I, I don't know. <laughs> How about, I don't, I, I want to make sure any of the uh, aspiring writers uh, are not too put off. How about some tips for writing? If we're for people who are watching and who enjoy writing themselves. We, I don't think either of us can give you the secret because we don't know what it is, but maybe some tips. <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, I think the most important tip is probably that there is no secret. You just have to write. You just have to get going. And you have to sort of, um, there's a famous thing that all writers feel, which is the fear of the blank page and, um, or the fear of the blank screen more likely now, but you just have to start writing. So that's the only secret is forget your, you know, all the voices in your head, which are telling you not to do it and just start writing. Um, and then the second tip is that you can always rewrite anything, you know, just start writing, and whatever you do, you can make it better. Mm -hmm. um, and the third tip is by far the most important one, which is that if you're interested in writing, you have to love reading and you just must read as much as possible. Read everything. I mean, you know, don't read boring books and bad books, but I mean, there are so many good books around. You can find a lifetime of good, good books to read and read them and I, I sort of feel uh I mean I I don't think all writers feel that feel this but I definitely feel like a reader not a writer um I I kind of um I'm more of a reader and and I think you definitely have to love reading and be interested in reading so if yeah my main tip for anyone interested in writing is get reading I th I, I totally agree I feel like I just, because I don't, my identity is a reader. I couldn't be a writer if I wasn't a reader first. And so I totally agree with that. Yeah. Amazing. So that was uh, some answers to some of your big questions. Um, thank you so much, uh, Josh, to coming and being on the uh, Book Wonders Club. And there's going to be more information uh, about Hope Jones and where you can find the books in the description box if you would like to check them out. Next up, we have our reading roundup. Now, this is where I tell you a little bit more about some of the other books that are coming out this month. Now, last episode, there was a huge number of books. It's slightly less uh, this month, but hopefully you will find something that you think might be your next favourite book. So first up we have The Elephant by Peter Canavis, which is a novel about a resilient little girl who longs for her dad to break free from the elephant of his depression. A Case of Grave Danger by Sophie Cleverly, illustrated by Hannah Peck, is a new detective series about Violet Vale, who wants nothing more than to prove her worth and become her father's apprentice at Vale and Sons Undertakers. Uma and the Answer to Absolutely Everything by Sam Copeland, illustrated by Sarah Horn, is the new book from the author of Charlie Changes into a Chicken, about a girl with a lot of questions who finds a genius artificial intelligence named Athena who knows everything. The Perfect Parent Project by Stuart Foster is the story of one boy in foster care and his search for the perfect family from the author of The Bubble Boy. Next up is When the World Was Ours by Liz Kessler. Inspired by a true story, this is a novel about three childhood friends living during the Second World War whose fates are closely intertwined even when their lives take very different courses. 
The Mysterious Island by Savia Pirata, illustrated by David Otto. This is the third book in the Wolfsong series, and in this adventure, Wolf's rival, Rain, has stolen his precious amulet, but his search to get it back takes him on a journey far beyond the world he knows. And the last book that's come out in the last couple of weeks is How to Be a Hero by Kat Weldon. First in a new trilogy for fans of Who Let the Gods Out about failing trainee Valkyrie Lotta, who mistakes an unconscious Viking thief for a fallen hero and takes him home to Valhalla. To round things out for this week's episode, we have our bookseller top tip. For this week's episode, we have the lovely Gavin from Waterstones in Gateshead, and he is going to tell you about one of the books he has loved that's come out in January. Hi, I'm Gavin and I am a children's and young adult bookseller at Waterstones. I also have a YouTube channel called How to Your Gavin, where I talk about all kinds of books, but mostly children's books. I absolutely love working for Waterstones and while the bookshops might not be open right now, you can still order books online at waterstones.com, so definitely check that out, especially for all your new children's book releases. A brand new release that I absolutely adore with my whole heart and would love to recommend to you is Darwin's Dragons by Lindsay Galvin. I absolutely adore adored this with my whole entire heart. This one follows a young boy called Sims and he is on a ship, the same ship as Charles Darwin. Now one day Sims accidentally falls overboard and ends up on this absolutely gorgeous tropical island and being on this island leads Sims to an incredible discovery of dragons. I absolutely adored the gorgeous descriptions of this tropical island as well as the character of Sims. He is such a relatable and a fantastic protagonist to follow. Not only do I love Sims but also there is a lizard called Farthing and it's just the most cutest and adorablest thing I've ever seen. So many great things to learn and discover in this book. So do try this one out. I think it will take so much from it. I think so many kids will enjoy the topics of conservation, of adventure, of discovery, and they will relate to Sims wholeheartedly, just like I did. And this is available to buy now on waterstones.com. So that is all we've got for episode two of the Book Wanderers Club. I hope that you have enjoyed watching. I hope that you've heard about some books that sound exciting to you. I hope you've been inspired to read and write and I hope you've enjoyed uh, hearing a bit more from some authors. Now as I've mentioned a few times you can get in touch at the club at gmail.com. You can send your writing, you can send your ideas, you can just say hi, you can let me know if your class would like to be part of uh, the big questions segment. I'll be back in two weeks time, halfway through February, with three more authors and until then happy book wandering. <laughs>